In the whole history of the Byzantine Empire, few centuries started as roughly as the 9th. It was a time of great upheaval and uncertainty for the heirs of Rome. The Arabs and Bulgars were menacing the empire with increasing ferocity. Internally, it was rocked by religious disputes and dynastic infighting. Meanwhile, on Christmas Day 800 AD, a wholly new threat sprang up in the West. On that day, the world awoke to the news that a new Roman Emperor was in town. For the first time in three centuries, Europe had a second empire that laid claim to the Roman inheritance, and the face of the continent was forever changed. It was into these trying times that the next imperial dynasty would step. Nicephorus, the dynasty's eponymous founder, rose to power in 802, with the fall of Empress Irene of Athens. She is most famous for blinding and deposing her own son in 797, and ruling in her own right for five years. Her unpopularity in the wake of her crime forced her to cut taxes, while the empire suffered continual defeats abroad and had to pay tribute to the Arabs, draining the treasury even further. As the 9th century rolled around, the Empress's regime was visibly fraying at the edges, yet Byzantium had no time to rest, for in 801 shocking news reached the court in Constantinople. On Christmas Day, Charlemagne, King of the Franks and ruler of much more besides, had been crowned Roman Emperor by the Pope. For the first time in a long time, Europe had a second empire. More worryingly still, it laid claim to the Roman legacy that Byzantium had guarded so closely. Understandably, the Byzantines were shocked and appalled, with many deciding that Irene had to go. The treasury was bare, the army in shambles, the empire's prestige permanently sullied. Given the state of the treasury, perhaps it's unsurprising that the challenge, when it finally did come, was spearheaded by Nicephorus, the finance minister. The coup d'etat of 802 was swift and successful. Nicephorus was crowned and Irene was quietly dispatched to the island of Lesbos, where she died a year later. Claiming the throne had been easy enough, but now the emperor had to defend his throne and sort out the empire's issues. Luckily, in Nicephorus, Byzantium had a man who was up to the challenge. Apparently descended from an Arab king, he was a patrician from the city of Seleucia Sidera, and possessed the qualities of determination and grit, qualities which recommended him to the empress, but also sometimes boiled over into inflexibility and unwise ambition. Irene appointed him finance minister in 799, and only three years later, Nicephorus, taking advantage of the discontent bubbling away under the surface, launched his coup. Nicephorus first turned his eyes to the poor state of the economy and the barren treasury. Tax remissions were reversed, while existing taxes were increased. Meanwhile, loans to merchants were only allowed to come from the state itself, which charged interest at an eye-watering 17%. More controversially, he had no qualms about milking the church for cash, confiscating ecclesiastical lands and precious metals, even going so far as to billet soldiers on monastic land. Understandably, the clergy was appalled, and the main chronicler for this period just so happens to be a monk, so Nicephorus receives extremely and unfairly harsh treatment in the historical record. Yet while Nicephorus's robust measures earned him little love, he was not particularly bothered. He was a hard-nosed man, and the treasury was now looking much healthier, so he began putting this money to use, drafting more men into the imperial armies. Men the imperial armies would have dire need of, as one of Nicephorus's first acts was to cancel the tribute the empire was paying to the Abbasid Caliph, Harun al-Rashid. The Caliph immediately launched an invasion. Unfortunately, disgruntlement led to one of the empire's top generals rebelling simultaneously. The result was catastrophe. The revolt was subdued, but the Arabs made serious gains, with Nicephorus himself suffering a great defeat at the Battle of Krasos in 805, and the disastrous wars continued until 806, when Nicephorus was forced to pay a tribute even more costly than before. Unfortunately, his failures against the Arabs were not isolated incidents, and Byzantium found itself hard-pressed on all sides, with the Muslims menacing Anatolia and the Bulgars regularly devastating Thrace. All the while, beyond the Adriatic, Charlemagne continued to champion his claim to the title of Emperor. In 803, Nicephorus sent envoys to Charlemagne, but no settlement was reached, with Nicephorus refusing to accept Charles' title. War eventually erupted when Venice did homage to the Franks in late 805, leading to a prolonged naval conflict starting the following year. Tensions would continue, and it would not be until later that a lasting settlement was reached between the two empires. Yet Charlemagne and his Franks were merely nuisances when compared to Nicephorus's greatest nemesis. For on all sides, the Byzantine Empire was faced by foes of exceptional quality. The Arabs had Harun al-Rashid, the Franks had Charlemagne, 
The Bulgars, meanwhile, had the meanest, toughest, and most formidable leader their nation ever produced, Krum. Krum rose to power in 803, and over the course of his reign, Bulgaria would double in size. He was a truly fearsome foe, and Nikephorus knew he had his work cut out for him. With Krum on the warpath, the Emperor looked to the defences of his European lands. First, he turned to the lands of Greece. During those days, it was inhabited by many Slavic tribes who had migrated there during the 7th and 8th centuries. The Slavs weren't present in huge numbers, but they were a potent and restless force in the region, and imperial control was practically non-existent in many areas. That began to change during the time of Irene's regency, when military expeditions reasserted central control. This process of reintegration was continued by Nikephoros, who feared Krum's expansionism and was wary of the Slavs in Greece joining forces with the Bulgars. He was finally driven to act in 805, when an army of Slavic rebels besieged Patras. They were defeated, but Nikephoros decided not to take any more chances. Thousands of Greeks from Anatolia were brought over to the Peloponnese. These new settlers brought with them Christianity in the Greek language, quickly re-Christianizing and re-Hellenizing the region. On top of this, Nikephoros also created new themes in Europe, strengthening the empire's defences. Nikephoros, always more of an administrator than a warrior, was less successful in his military ventures. He had to abandon an invasion of Bulgaria in 807, after a plot against him was discovered. In 808, a Byzantine army was destroyed near the mouth of the Strymon River. Then, in 809, Krum captured Serdica, slaughtering its garrison of 6,000. It was a disaster, and worse still, it was a humiliation. Nikephoros had never been popular at the best of times, and these were certainly not the best of times. The people demanded blood for his failures, and Nikephoros would have to act. That same year, Caliph Harun al-Rashid died, throwing the Abbasid Caliphate into civil war. The Arabs would not be a threat for the time being, so Nikephoros peeled his armies off the Eastern Front for a major campaign against Krum. This time, the Emperor resolved to finish off Krum for good. All of the following year was spent assembling an army equal to these lofty ambitions. Troops were drawn from across the realm, while a new Tagma, a unit of professional soldiers, was formed. By the time 811 rolled around, the Emperor had, or at least he thought he had, an army capable of obliterating his foes. In May, with perhaps as many as 30,000 men at his back, he finally set off. The goal? Pliska, Krum's capital. Alongside Nikephoros marched his eldest son and co-emperor, Staurakios. Initially, all went well. Krum, overawed by the sheer size of the Byzantine army, refused to meet it in battle, and retreated to the mountains. Nikephoros, for his part, had developed at least some notion of military strategy, for he was able to trick his way through the mountain passes by launching his series of diversionary raids. Then, with the mountains cleared, he marched upon Pliska, smashing his way into Crumb's capital, and slaughtering its garrison of 12,000 along with many citizens. The Bulgar Khan was powerless to halt this irresistible advance, instead slinking quietly away into the mountains. Hot off the heels of his triumph, Nikephoros grew cocky, as Crumb probably knew he would, and marched south to try and root out Crumb from the mountains. The Bulgar Khan tried to sue for peace, but the Emperor was having none of it. He would have his triumph. He led his army into the mountains, hunting around in vain for Crumb's forces. Little did Nikephoros know, he was walking into a trap. On the 24th of July, the Byzantine host entered the Varbitsa Pass, without sending scouts to check ahead. On the 25th, they awoke to find the narrow pass sealed off at both ends, with wooden palisades. They were doomed, yet it would be another day until the assault finally came, with the Bulgars putting the finishing touches on their barricades. After a gloomy night, dawn broke on the 26th, and then the slaughter began. The Bulgars threw themselves at their helpless foes, artificially inducing landslides to fall on the Byzantine army, and burning many Imperial soldiers to a crisp by setting fire to the barricades. The army was slaughtered almost to a man, and Emperor Nikephoros I was among the dead. The last time an Emperor had died in battle was all the way back in 378, when Valens had fallen at the Battle of Adrianople. Now, once again, the Byzantines were struck with the body blows of defeat and humiliation. For the Emperor, not even death could end his troubles, and Crum ordered Nikephoros' skull to be turned into a drinking cup to commemorate his finest victory. And what a victory it was! The Emperor was dead, his army destroyed, his empire left rudderless. Most had been slaughtered at the Varbitsa Pass, most but not all. Two men in particular had escaped the slaughter. 
First was Staurakios, the son of Nikephoros and the new emperor. Second was Michael Rangabi, Nikephoros' son-in-law. Yet even they had not escaped unscathed, and Staurakios had suffered a grievous wound which had severed his spinal cord, leaving him paralysed. He was carried first to Adrianople, where what few troops remained proclaimed him emperor, before making his way in incomprehensible agony to the capital. As the survivors trickled back to Constantinople, bringing news of the catastrophe with them, a wave of horror swept over the capital. Horror and confusion too. Two emperors had marched out, barely one had returned, and Staurakios, paralysed and in agony, clung to life only by the thinnest of threads. As he had no children, the question of the succession was flung wide open, with two options presenting themselves. On one hand, there was Michael Rangabi, the husband of Nikephoros' daughter Procopia, and thus the brother-in-law of Staurakios. On the other was Staurakios' own wife, Theophano. Theophano is an interesting woman in her own right. A relative of Empress Irene, she also hailed from Athens, and like her kinswoman, hoped to rule the empire. Staurakios nurtured a strong dislike of Michael, and thus favoured Theophano, yet the majority sided with Michael. It had only been nine years since Irene's downfall, and few were interested in a second experiment in female power. Despite Staurakios' protests, his incapacity prevented him from influencing events, and Michael was proclaimed emperor without Staurakios' knowledge or consent on the 2nd of October. It had only been 68 days since the tragic circumstances of his succession, when his father had been slain and he had been paralysed. For the brief time Staurakios ruled, he was a broken reed. Few emperors were as wretched, miserable or pitiable as him, and in the final few months he was never again to know peace. The wounds that had plagued him during his reign continued to fester, until he finally died of gangrene on the 11th of January 812. When the end finally did come, it came as a blessed relief. Byzantium now had its third emperor in three months. Unfortunately, Michael I was not an improvement, being weak-willed and spineless, he tended to follow the advice of the last person he talked to, and possessed none of the qualities needed in a leader or a statesman. He was, it must be said, quite pious, yet this often led him into splurging excessive sums of money on churches and other religious institutions. More productively, he worked to reduce tensions in the church. This is an element of Nikephoros' reign I've glossed over so far, but essentially, Nikephoros ran roughshod over the church, taxing them and meddling in their affairs, much to the annoyance of the clergy. Michael reversed all of this, letting the church do its own thing. Finally, he recalled churchmen Nikephoros had banished, such as Theodore the Studite, a man of immense personal magnetism and force of will. As befitting the weakling he was, Michael immediately fell under the influence of Theodore. Early in 812, Michael I took the only noteworthy decision of his reign. He recognised Charlemagne's claim to be emperor, allowing him to style himself Imperator in Latin, and Basilius in Greek. Where Michael drew the line was recognising him as Imperator Romanorum, Emperor of the Romans, something he reserved exclusively for himself. The policy of denying Charlemagne's claims hadn't really worked out for the Empire, with it resulting only in a rather pointless naval conflict. The traditional narrative of this event speaks of the unbending Nikephorus stubbornly refusing Charlemagne, and of the weak Michael suddenly caving in the wake of the disaster at the Varbitsa Pass. Yet the truth is rarely so straightforward. The war between the two empires had ended in 810, when Venice returned to the Byzantine fold, opening the path for diplomatic normalisation. Several weeks before Nikephoros' death, Byzantine diplomats were present in Francia, hammering out the details of a settlement. For his part, Charlemagne was offering very generous terms for recognition, and the details of the subsequent Byzantine recognition of the Frankish claim were possibly already decided by the time of Varbitsa. Meanwhile, Crum took advantage of his triumph by applying continued pressure, Michael tried to march out against him, but the army mutinied and he was forced to return home with nothing having been accomplished. Now that Michael had yielded, the people prepared for Crum's next attack. Strangely, nothing came. Instead, Crum offered terms, and quite good terms at that, which would give Byzantium the breathing room it desperately needed. Sadly, at the insistence of Theodore the Studite, the Emperor refused on religious grounds. So Crum turned to his next victim, the Black Sea port of Mesembria one of the most stoutly defended in the empire. Sitting astride a thin peninsula, Mesembria only had one entrance. As such, the defence should have been an easy matter, but the imperial navy had declined under Michael's predecessors, and the emperor himself made no attempt to relieve the city. 
It was as the siege of Mesembria dragged on that a worrying disturbance occurred in the capital. During a religious service, a group of iconoclast soldiers burst into the Church of the Holy Apostles, the burial place of emperors for centuries, and threw themselves at the feet of the tomb of Constantine V, begging him to return from death and save the empire. Unsurprisingly, nothing of the sort happened, but it illustrates the changing sentiments in Byzantium. It had been 40 years since the day of Constantine V, but the old emperor's magic still captured the imagination of Byzantines. His reign had been a time of victories. It had also, crucially, been a time of iconoclasm. Yet the time of iconoclasm had been cut short in 787, when Empress Irene denounced the doctrine at the Council of Nicaea, and ever since the empire had been rocked by defeat. First with Irene and then with Nikephorus, Anatolia had been battered by Arab invasions. Now, with the ravaged Staurakios and the gutless Michael, defeat and despair seemed to shadow the empire at every turn. For many, this was no coincidence. The Byzantines had forsaken iconoclasm, now God had forsaken them. Only with the reintroduction of iconoclasm, seemingly the doctrine of winners, could defeat be staved off. Those who held this view felt vindicated when, in November 812, Mesembria finally fell. Put shortly, the boot was now on the other foot as far as iconoclasm was concerned, and the iconoclast upswing would only continue over the coming years. Whether iconoclast or iconophile, all Byzantines were now unified in demanding that Michael do something. He had dithered and demurred these past few months, but with the shadow of Crum looming ever larger, they were no longer prepared to take his attacks lying down. Thus Michael spent the winter gathering soldiers from all corners of the empire, until, in May 813, he set off at the head of a massive column of troops. With him, he brought some of his best generals, John Aplakis and Leo the Armenian. Even now, the emperor was apprehensive and hesitant to attack. Fighting Bulgar armies was only half the battle, finding them was often just as tough. They were slippery, often scattering in the face of overwhelming force. Nikephorus had died in the pursuit of Crum's scattered armies through the mountains, and Michael, who had only escaped that disaster by a hair's breadth, was in no mood to see history repeat itself. Then something strange happened, the first of many strange happenings on Michael's ill-fated campaign. When the Bulgars under Crum chose to meet the far superior Byzantine force in open battle, the armies drew up across from one another at a field called Versanicia. Michael had with him 20 to 30,000 men, Crum perhaps 12,000 at most. Even with this overwhelming advantage, the emperor continued to dither, refusing to engage the enemy for a fortnight until his subordinate, John Aplakis, asked permission to attack. Michael finally gave the order, and on the 22nd of June, the battle began. John Aplakis, commanding the right wing, performed well, smashing his foes and driving them back. As he thrusted forward, he grew detached from the rest of the army, and Crum moved to counter his advance. It was at this point that the rest of the army could have been expected to move forward and support, yet it did nothing of the sort. Instead, incredibly, the left wing, commanded by Leo the Armenian, fled in terror. Understandably, Crum was gobsmacked, but he was not slow in turning this development to his advantage, surrounding and slaughtering the luckless troops under John Aplakis. With his army crumbling around him, Michael also chose this moment to flee the field. Crum couldn't believe his luck, literally. He just stared dumbly at the Byzantines as they withdrew, believing this to be some sort of trap. Soon, however, it became obvious that this really wasn't a trap, and the Imperial army really was in flight, so the Bulgars set off in pursuit. In addition to the casualties in the valiant right wing, many others fell in this disorderly retreat. Once again, Crum had smashed a superior Byzantine army. Once again, he had laid an emperor low. Michael in particular, never strong at the best of times, felt his humiliation most acutely, and felt that he could no longer carry on. His spirit was broken, and despite the protests of his wife Procopia, he decided to abdicate the throne on the 11th of July. This made him the third emperor in a row to be brought down by Crum. Two had been killed or otherwise grievously wounded, and now a third had been driven to abdicate. Testament to the ferocity of this Bulgar warlord. Thus the ill-fated and short-lived Nikephorian dynasty came to an end. Michael, Procopia and their family were spared, although their sons were castrated, and they peacefully entered exile. Fate, however, was not entirely done with the House of Nikephorus, and one member will play an important part in the century to come. Can you guess who it is? In Michael's place, the throne was claimed by Leo the Armenian, now Leo V, the same man whose troops had fled the field at Versanicia thus ensuring Michael's defeat and abdication. 
Leo was perhaps the most qualified person to take the reins at this terrible time. Both brave and talented, he was an obvious choice. Yet we are left with a thorny question. What had happened at the Battle of Versinicia? The soldiers he commanded were among the most experienced in the Empire. They were not the type to flee so shamefully. But if not experience, then what can explain the cowardice of his men? The answer comes in a word the Byzantines knew well. Treachery. Many believe that Leo willingly betrayed his emperor and forsook his comrades, and those that do also point to the strange decisions taken by Crumb. For example, engaging the Imperial Army in the first place seemed wildly out of character for Crumb. He knew his army wasn't a match for the Byzantine one, and the last time a huge Byzantine army came rolling through Bulgaria, he stole away into the mountains, using ambushes and guerrilla tactics. Why suddenly the change of tack? Why, unless he knew that such a gamble would pay off, did he take such a risk? Well, perhaps he did know that such a gamble would work. Perhaps those guarantees came from none other than Leo himself, a devious and deeply ambitious man who would stop at nothing to claim the throne. Both men had much to gain from this brief pact. Crumb could crush another army, and if Michael was suitably discredited, then Leo would be able to claim the throne. Certainly, if Leo did make an accomplice of Crumb, then he played his hand masterfully, staying on the battlefield until all of his men had fled to avoid accusations of cowardice. Regardless of the details, the ultimate outcome was the same. Michael was down and out, and Leo V was in. Yet with their ungentlemanly gentleman's agreement done, Crumb and Leo prepared for the next round in this brutal slugfest. They had both profited handsomely from their deal. Now, like the trained bloodhounds they were, the two men began circling each other, sniffing for weakness. In the wake of the defeat, the Byzantines could not halt Crumb's advance, but Leo worked hard to strengthen the walls before the Bulgars arrived. Then, on the 17th of July, they drew up before the walls of Constantinople. Leo's gamble had paid off, but had he doomed Byzantium in the process? Unfortunately, this is where we leave the story for now, with the Nikephorian dynasty in tatters, with barbarians at the gates, with iconoclasm making a subtle return. So these loose ends will have to await the next video to be tied up. Many thanks to my generous Consul tier YouTube member, Chris Manger, for supporting the channel. Being a YouTube member really is the best way to help the channel out. So if you want to see more, then consider doing that.